How does that happen? All right, our, our class right now is called Panic Attacks and Other Limbic System Disturbances. Who's aware that they have a limbic system disturbance? At least we can call it by the right thing. <laughs> it's not that I'm a bitch. I have a limbic <laughs> system disturbance. <laughs> All right. You guys are having too much fun at a seminar on trauma. I just have to get you under control here. <laughs> So let's look at the limbic system. There are many emotional aspects that come along with autoimmune illnesses, pain syndromes, and stress. It constitutes more than an overload on your nervous system that impacts your ability to function and to feel well. So the limbic system can cause problems with sleep, with depression, with poor memory, irritability. It can cause you to make poor judgments concentration problems, feelings of agitation, and panic attacks. Do you have any of these symptoms? <laughs> <laughs> so in our brains, there are several primitive structures that give us critical abilities that are needed for the survival of our species. And the limbic system is the group of brain structures that help us to fight or to run away in emergency. The limbic system also helps us to remember events that cause strong emotions. So that means if you have a lot of trauma, your limbic system is always being fired up. So where is the limbic system? Deep within the center of our advanced thinking brain, the cerebral hemispheres, there's a primitive, what we call the emotional brain. The limbic system consists of several structures, including the amygdala, which is sometimes called the rage center or the danger flasher. It's like the red sirens that go off in your head whenever your brain perceives danger. And the hippocampus, which is an important part of the brain's memory system. When stress occurs, your nervous system signals your body to pump out adrenaline and it primes the body for action. We recognize that what happens in the brain affects the body and vice versa. And that knowledge gives us the tools that we need in order to manage the situation. So psychological stress can turn into physical pain and illness in a number of ways. One is the body's primitive fight or flight mechanism. And I also was recently reading a neurology magazine that they were talking about the center in the brain that pro processes physical pain is the exact same structure that processes emotional pain. I didn't know that it happened in the same exact region. Um, when the when the pain senses when the brain senses a threat, it activates the sympathetic nervous system and signals the adrenal glands to pump out adrenaline, cortisol, and other hormones that prime the body for action. Together, they make the muscles tense up, the digestive tract slow down, blood vessels constrict, and the heart beat faster. And the spinal cord controls pain signals from the body to the brain, depending largely on patients' emotional states. So positive emotions diminish the perception of pain, while negative emotions keep the gates open, uh, sometimes continuing the pain even after the initial cause has disappeared. It's interesting, isn't it? Stress also creates biochemical changes that can affect the immune system. Stress can raise the level of inflammation in the body, which has been associated with heart disease and illness. Under stress, there's a large amount of negative emotional energy in your system that's trying to find a way to discharge. Our bodies are electric and can misfire. Um, and exercise can help activate and discharge the electricity in your body and it helps make new connections between your brain and your body. And there's a reason I wanted to study all this. There's always a reason. But this one wasn't about my patients. This was about myself. <laughs> when I, in 2011, I broke my foot at our Rachel's Vineyard Leadership Conference. And after I broke my foot, I 
develop um, something called RSD. It's reflex sympathetic dystrophy. It's a neuromuscular disease, and I had it since my 20s. It was diagnosed as MS, but then I would get better, and I'm an athlete, and that's how I would deal with my stress. So what happens is that the brain doesn't process it right, and no one knows what causes it, but I do because I studied neurology. <laughs> it's from sleep deprivation, and a lot of soldiers get RSD. So if you get an injury, you get a break, you get um, a surgery or something, um, it doesn't follow the normal path of healing, and you get all this inflammation, and then it spreads everywhere. So in the height of my, I spent over a year in a wheelchair. I couldn't hold a fork. I had double vision. It's a lot like MS. So I wanted to learn everything that I could, including what was causing it. And I used all alternative medicine. My brother's a chiropractor. I did all alternative treatments to get back on my feet. I know that if I had followed the normal course of treatment, which is a lot of painkillers, I'd be sucking my thumb in a wheelchair right now. <laughs> and I think that I, I apply what I was learning in that situation because the soldiers get it, they have sleep deprivation. So you get a shrapnel wound, and then it doesn't heal, and then, then they end up on all these painkillers, and then they're committing suicide between the PTSD and the pain and the drugs that make them not be able to think clearly so they can even keep their job. So I learned a whole lot about it, and I had for years been aware that there were so many people in our ministry, by the time they were in their 40s, 50s, people with histories of abortion, people with histories of sexual abuse, they had all the autoimmune illnesses. They had lupus. They had fibromyalgia. They had, like, um, cancers. Cancers out the wazoo. If I turn around and hear about another ministry leader with cancer, you know, it, it, and, and I know that our, s our world is, like, everybody doesn't eat right and our lifestyle is not right and all that. But, but beyond that, I thought that there was a significant role to play because of the trauma and what I already knew about stress keeping a secret for years, holding that balloon down for years, and just the relational dramas. Because if you're a trauma drama junkie for years and years because no one's helped you get off the wheel or you don't know how to heal through no fault of your own, a lot of it's embedded in the limbic system, which we're going to talk about. Um, it just seemed, it seemed that we have to be able to know more to help people get healthy. And sometimes getting healthy is more than just dealing with your trauma, there's lifestyle changes that should come with that as well. Um, and it's particularly hard for women who are caretakers, right? We take care of everybody. We solve all the crisis while men watch football. And there's only one man here who's not watching football, and we have to applaud, applaud Ernie. <laughs> How about him coming out here to be with all us estrogen-laden women? <laughs> We're really happy that you're here with us. And he's a therapist. I asked if he was Mary Lee's pastor. <laughs> I heard she had a pastor with a beard. I, I assumed it was you. <laughs> but we're glad that you're here with us. So the other thing that happened to me, and I had to understand this, whenever I went into a room, because I was really, um, my, I was misdiagnosed. I was put on drugs I was allergic to. It was like really a hard time. And I was mad a lot, you know. And um, I never was an angry person, ever. No one ever heard me swear or have Tourette's syndrome, which was pretty serious. <laughs> so I wanted to understand all that. But whenever I would come into a room, and lots of people saw this happen, I would disrupt the electrical equipment in the room. Like lights would flash. You, you almost think like poltergeist where stuff's flying across the room. <laughs> but, but it wasn't that. It was that... Normally, I think I have a lot of energy, and all my en energy was misfiring. All my nerve impulses were misfiring. If I told my brain to move my foot, it wasn't happening, but that intent, that energy was going off, and I really wanted to understand it. And even when I would get in a car, I would get in my sister's car, and all of a sudden, her GPS wouldn't work. The whole thing would scramble. I would sit at a computer, and it would go on without a password right to the place I wanted. It was bizarre. It was freaky. It was really, really weird, and I wanted to understand it before I started to think I was possessed by a demon, you know. <laughs> but but um, that was just something I really wanted to study. So I kind of went in, and I'm just sh sharing, like, the, the, the stuff that will be relevant to you. But that's why I wanted to learn this. So the truth is that you are responsible for your own stress. You can't blame anybody else in your life for what they're making you do because at the end of the day, you're in charge of yourself. And if you don't take care of yourself, no one else is going to. I can promise you that. Um, 
So you got to get plenty of sleep and eat regular, balanced meals and keep up your social connections. And what are the first things to go when you're having stress? Sleep, your food, dinner is suddenly like a bag of potato chips <laughs> or some... And I want to say, listen to your gut. The gut brain is extremely sensitive to thoughts and emotions. How many times have you gone against your gut only to find yourself at odds with the natural flow of things? And how many people don't listen to their gut because someone else's opinion is more directive? Lillian's raising her hand high. She wants <laughs> We're always right. We're always right. <laughs> How many times have you allowed others to dictate your choices by putting down or opposing your opinions or your voice? This is why finding your voice in healing is so critical. And I hope that your voice sounds different than the person next to you because we're not all supposed to be robots thinking and acting alike. We get caught up in the business of doing, and the more we can tune into our intuitive gut, the better off that we are. And I truly believe that this is where and how God speaks to us. Trust your instincts. I take in all the information that I can gather, no matter what. And I'm a leader. I deal with a ton of people all over the world. Um, and I want to hear people's opinions, their proposals, their ideas, and their advice. But at the end of the day, I'm going to go with my gut, and I'm going to do what my heart feels most strongly. And when you, um, when you don't know what to do, it's a good time to do nothing. You don't want to make decisions when you're under stress. Um, especially important to, to stress. And I say get quiet so you can hear the still, small voice, your g inner GPS or your God programming system because he will speak to you. And don't allow others to detour your route, throw up roadblocks, or make you lose your confidence. And how many people in this room can have their confidence easily undermined? Not too many, that's good. Rest, you might be lying, but... <laughs> or it's a really healthy room because it's filled with therapists, right? <laughs> I always joke that therapists, um, a, lot of, a lot of us go into the field so that we can figure out ourselves. And I always say it would be much cheaper to just go to counseling <laughs> than pay all the money to become a master's or a, a doctor. <laughs> but let's look at panic attacks. Um, we talked about this this morning. Um, the intense period of discomfort, which um, four or more of the following symptoms come, and I, me I mentioned them earlier. So how does the limbic system work? If someone were to be attacked, the limbic system would first produce fear. Fear is the first response, and then perhaps rage. Rage is right on the heels of fear because it's easier to feel rageful because what, what happens when you're angry? You feel powerful. Nobody wants to feel the weakness of fear. It feels like it's weak. Um, and the fear would energize the body to help you run away, if possible. If not, your limbic system might trigger a rage, which will prepare the body to fight in a ferocious manner to protect yourself or your loved ones. A picture of a mother bear protecting her cubs from a predator. And you get the idea, right? Has anyone experienced that that you'd be willing to share. This experience where you're just enraged after being scared by something. Yes. Can I give you the microphone? So hi, my name's Karen. I'm with the Dallas Fort Worth group from um, Involve for Life Pregnancy Center. And my husband and I were in a car accident in December and we were both pretty much in a lot of pain, and if I could have moved, I would have beat the crap out of them. A lot of pain, we were hurt, and I couldn't get out of the car, and I would have just beat the shit. Do you want to share yours? Here, I'll bring this up to you. Excuse my bare feet. <laughs> it's actually not mine, it's my grandson's, but it's a prime example He's 18 months old, and I was out with him, and a big dog came at him, and the fence separated him. But my 18-month-old was, like, screaming in fear. Ah! And then all of a sudden, he stopped, and he said, Stop! 
Stop it, puppy. <laughs> Powerful. <laughs> Made me think of um, when I was trying to recover from my sleep deprivation. We have this dog next door that would bark and bark and bark. Every time I'd fall asleep, it would bark. And um, I went out one time, and I was wearing army fatigues, and I had a baseball bat, and I'd go up to the fence, and I'm like, shut the up. <laughs> and I looked him right in the eye, and I snarled him down, and he walked away whimpering, like, <laughs> like I scared him. You're not so tough as you think. Now shut up. We can't sleep. <laughs> so, yeah, being sleep-deprived can bring out these <laughs> wonderful <laughs> So why is the limbic system important for neuropsychiatric disorders? Since this is our emotional brain, it's vulnerable to disorders in brain chemistry and brain electricity, electrical activity in our brain. Some disorders run in family and are genetic, or they're acquired by developmental brain damage. That can happen from drug and alcohol used by the mother during pregnancy, um, a difficult birth, can cause when a baby's stuck in the canal or all those things. Um, a disorder in the emotion brain can produce emotions that are out of control and extreme acts of violence, suicidal behavior, agitation, and mood swings can be due to disorders of this brain system. Um, when I had difficult births, I was bedridden for a lot of my pregnancies. Now I know it was RSD and it was with an injury. And with my daughter, Katie, I fell down the steps, I had a laundry basket, and I um, tripped on my son's Fisher Price Little People at the top of the steps. We lived in a row home with steep steps with no carpet, and I went right down and broke my hip. And this was, um, so I spent a lot of that in bed, and then because of a pregnancy loss before that, at six months, that was another trauma. So you have a trauma and a physical injury. but. I had started to go into labor before she was born, and so I had to be on bed rest then. And then I had a really, really, really traumatic birth. And when it was, I was full into RSD, and I was shaking so bad I couldn't hold that baby. Like I couldn't hold her, so I couldn't nurse her, and I felt like a failure because I want to be Mother Earth, you know. <laughs> and um, and I felt like I'd failed because all the colostrum, all the everything, and I went to stay with my mother who cared for me and um, had a lot of difficulty with that pregnancy and with her afterwards, and she was colicky. I think because of all my stress, she picked up the immature, immu um, immature nervous system and then was screaming all the time, so I couldn't comfort her, and it was really, really hard. And then you have all the sleep deprivation because you have a screaming baby all night that you can't comfort. And this is when mo a lot of moms are very vulnerable. You have a colicky baby, you're not sleeping, and you go into a birth experience sleep deprived many times because it's uncomfortable or whatever else is going on. But I really saw early and in our work with the maternity home and whatnot just how much support is needed by pregnant women. You know, with or without an injury, just it's a time of so much change. So when you're in crisis, um, it's, it's a hard time. But with, the, with Katie, I wanted her to know that I loved her and that um, we played this game for years, this traumatic play of when she would be born, because I felt like I kind of missed out on that important bonding time with the infant. And um, so we would play this game, and I would push her out of the covers, meaning I'm rebirthing her. So she would lift her head up, and I would push and push and push, and then she would come through the covers into my arms, and I'd be like, oh, I'm so happy you're here. I always wanted a little girl, and I would just spoke these things. And I, I talk like that to people on the retreat, like all those words of life that you, that you say over your children. We do that over people in the retreats because they've never heard words of life spoken over them, especially from abusive childhood. When you ask them to draw a picture of when they were a perfect creation before all the all abuse started, they have no concept of what that would be like. They have no way to nurture themselves or sometimes the children they have because of all the attachment injury. So being an attachment therapist that I was at the time, working with a lot of foster kids, I wanted to make sure my own daughter. Well, it became such a game that all my children wanted. They all wanted to be rebirthed, <laughs> all of them. So, <laughs> so I'd be laying in bed, pushing them all out. Oh, 
oh, you're <laughs> again and again. But you know what? You can't say it enough. You can't say it enough to a child. Did you know that you can't say it enough to adults? That we all need to love and be loved. That is one of the biggest needs, and we'll talk more about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I think, in another thing. But disorders can um, arise from these things. And the, the five Fs, which we've si I've been talking about, the fight, the flight, fear, freeze, and fawning, um, we want to go over what are the personality characteristics of those. Do you know if you're a fighter? Raise your hand if you're a fighter. Who's a fleer? Who gets afraid? Who freezes? And who knows what fawning is? Fawning, if you haven't heard of it, is where you can't say no to anybody and you're overly compliant and you placate anybody and it comes from abuse. It comes from trauma. It comes because the best example is like a, a woman in a domestic violence situation who is afraid to upset her s husband or call any attention to herself. So she will make sure that the house is perfect. She will put food on his TV dinner as he's watching a football game. She will tiptoe around because she thinks if she does anything wrong and gets his attention, she's going to be beat. That's an extreme version of fawning, but there's other people who want to please everybody around them because they can't stand anyone getting mad at them because if someone's mad at them, they're going to be hurt or controlled or whatever the fear is. So that's fawning, and these are all reactions to trauma. So the fight types, now these are just phenotypes. How many of you are like a pinwheel and you just go around on that circle <laughs> depending on <laughs> whatever's happening? But some people kind of gravitate to one of the types, so I'm just going to give some characteristics of them. Fight types avoid real intimacy by unconsciously alienating others with their angry and controlling demands for the unmet childhood needs of unconditional love. The flight types stay perpetually busy and industrious to avoid potentially triggering interactions. The freeze types hide away in their rooms. And um, fawning types avoid emotional investment and potential disappointment by barely showing themselves, by hiding behind their helpful personas, over listening, over eliciting, or overdoing for others, by giving service but never risking real self exposure and the possibility of deeper level of rejection. Fear is just fear, <laughs> you avoid out of fear. So variances are found due to childhood abuse, to patterns of neglect. The birth order can also influence what type you are, and genetic predispositions. So individuals who experience good enough parenting in childhood arrive in adulthood with a very healthy and what I would call flexible repertoire when they're faced with danger. If you're flexible, it means that you can be creative, you can think quickly on your feet, you can adjust your plan according to whether it's a failure or not. You know anybody who wants to stick to the plan when the ship's going down? <laughs> and everyone dies with them unless you're smart enough to jump off the boat and swim to shore yourself. So in the face of real danger, they have appropriate access to all of their five F choices. Easy access to the fight response ensures good boundaries and healthy assertiveness and aggressive self-protection if necessary. If um, I'm being bullied by somebody, I want to be able to do my martial arts kick move. I'll try that first before I jump out the window <laughs> like the cowardly lion. Untraumatized individual individuals can easily access their flight instinct and disengage and retreat when confrontation would exacerbate the danger. You know, anybody that wants to sit in the fight and, they ca and everybody's saying, stop it, pull back, or they're going to start yelling at a cop. Next thing you know, they'll find themselves in jail if they don't shut up. Because they don't know to stop it, it's going to hurt you. They also freeze appropriately and give up and quit struggling when further activity or resistance is futile or counterproductive. They're able to use their wits and make those decisions. Someone with trauma can't. And finally, they also fawn in a relaxed or even a playful manner. 
and are able to listen, help, and compromise as readily as they assert and express themselves and their needs and their rights and their points of view. And there's people who've saved their lives when they're with like a, a rapist or something because they act like they're not scared, they start to talk to them, they say they can become friends, you know, they're gonna try whatever they think will work in the situation. So those who are repetitively traumatized in childhood learn to survive by over-relying on one of the five Fs. Fixation in any one of the F response not only limits the ability to access all the others, but it also severely impairs the individual's ability to relax into an undefended state, forcing them into a very narrow, rigid life. Over time, habitual F defense distracts the individual from accumulating unbearable feelings of their current alienation and their unresolved past trauma. So let's look at complex PTSD actually as an attachment disorder. Has anyone thought of that before? Usually, any you know what attachment disorder is before I move on? Attachment disorder is when you fail to bond with another person. It usually happens in childhood. And it can also happen from, um, from a change in caretakers, like multiple caretakers, because a child will learn if the mom goes off and isn't available or is working all the time and has a nanny, a child will attach to anybody. So whether it's grandma or a nanny or a babysitter or a neighbor, a child will attach to anybody, and that's not a problem. What's a problem is when the caretakers that they attach to keep going away because a child will experience grief, sometimes rage, and they'll learn that by attaching to someone it brings pain to me. And so they can grow up not attaching. And when, you're not, when you have attachment disorder, there's a lot of acting out and there's an inability to feel empathic. They don't feel empathy. So someone with attachment disorder can go on and and um, just always be concerned about meeting their needs a lot of times and not be able to see that other people have feelings because none of their feelings were ever validated or responded to. And that's a little, very brief summary of attachment disorder. So whether you had it in childhood or you have an extremely traumatic um, thing that happens, you it shatters your assumptions about the world, about its safety, about the people who cared for you, about the people who left you alone or abandon you, whatever the trauma was. And so it shakes up everything and you can be afraid to attach to people because you're going to get hurt. How many of you can see that that happening as a result of a breakup of a relationship? I'm afraid to ever date again. I never want to feel that pain again. A lot of people can, can go through that, the first attachment. So um, polarization into a fight, flight, freeze, or fawn response is not only the developing child's unconscious attempt to avoid danger, but also a strategy to purchase some illusion of attachment. So they can be very ambivalent about real intimacy because deep relating so easily triggers them into painful emotional flashbacks. Emotional flax flashbacks are instant and sometimes prolonged regressions into intense overwhelming states of childhood, abuse and neglect. So being close to someone, especially if the abuse and neglect is happening in your family, these are your closest intimate attachments. Um, so fear, shame, alienation, rage, grief, and depression are the results. And habituated F defenses offer protection against further re-abandonment hurts by relating in a way that's prone to re-invoke childhood feelings of being attacked, unseen, and unappreciated. And this is where victims can attract more of the same feeling again and again. They put themselves in situations or they act in a way where they elicit that from people. Oh, nobody likes me, I don't have any friends. And they can't look at what they did to cause that. And I'm not saying it's their fault, they just learned a relational style that brings unhealthiness instead of healthy relational style. So let's describe the four basic defensive structures that develop out of our instinct. And um, most people choose or specialize in our response, as I said. Narcissism, narcissistic is usually the flight response. And um, that doesn't mean that everyone who raised their hand who says they're a fighter is a narcissist. <laughs> just, to <laughs> just to clarify there, we're talking about 
when you get controlled by the limbic system. And remember that narcissism is not that you love yourself and you think you're great. Narcissism really comes out, and there's many degrees of it, but it really comes out of a, a very low self-esteem and a very broken sense of their value. And so they compensate for that by needing to be the best at everything or feel like they're the best at everything or make everybody think that that and they can be kind of controlling <coughs> especially if they become abusive so and again these are like just personality traits characteristics so the obsessive compulsive are usually the flight types and um, dissociative are the freeze ones and codependents are the fawners understanding and being able to explain these survival states I call this psychoeducation it really helps to motivate, normalize, <coughs> take a drink here. The narcissist is the fight, the OCDs are the flight, the dissociative are the freeze, and codependent are the fawners. That's fear. Understanding and being able to explain them is psychoeducation, and it helps to motivate, normalize, and provide immediate insight and awareness of the behaviors that beca can become an obstacle to recovery. This is perhaps the hardest part of healing. It's really hard because up until then, you're talking about the stories of what everybody else did to you, and this is where you have to take responsibility for yourself. How are you continuing to be a perpetrator? And most women are perpetrators to themselves. They engage in all the self-destructive. Women will act in, men act out, but plenty of women act out as well. So I can't really stereotype it, but as, as a rule. Um, the fight type and the narcissistic defense. Let's look at this in detail since you're interested. Are you interested? <laughs> Fight types are unconsciously driven by the belief that power and control can create safety, prevent abandonment, and secure love. Children who are spoiled and given insufficient limits, it's a u that's a unique type of abandonment when you're just spoiled to death. <laughs> and children who are allowed to imitate the bullying of the narcissistic parent may develop a fixated fight response to being triggered. They learn this. It's modeled to them. These types learn to respond to their feelings of abandonment with anger and subsequently to use contempt, which is a toxic aspect of narcissistic rage and disgust, to intimidate and shame others into mirroring them and into acting as extensions of themselves. So a good narcissist can trigger someone else so that they look like the crazy person. The entitled fight type commonly uses others as an audience for his or her incessant monopolizing and may treat a captured freeze or fawn type as a slave or prisoner in dominant submissive relationship. We're talking about abusive relationships here, okay? Especially devolved fight types may become sociopathic, ranging along a continuum that stretches between corrupt politician and a vicious criminal. What would you say, Lillian? Oh, yeah. <laughs> he does hate women, I think. <laughs> Unless he's in bed with them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know what? We'll send you the notes. I think yeah, I can send you the... Yeah, just email my office. Just say you want the panic attack thing. So treatment... The treatment for fight types, um, they're treatable and they benefit from psychoeducation about the high price that they pay for controlling others by intimidating them. There's a very high price to that. Less injured types are able to see how partners become so afraid and resentful of them that they can't manifest the warmth or real liking that the fight type so desperately desires. And the downward spiral of power and alienation is the excessive use of that power, I'm sorry, the excessive use of power is tr 
triggering to the person they're doing it to. Um, there's a fearful emotional withdrawal in the other, which makes the fight type feel even more abandoned and in turn more outraged and more contemptuous, which further distances the intimate, which in turn increases their rage and disgust. So it's a very vicious cycle, which creates increasing distance and withholding of warmth ad nauseum. It just goes on and on and on. You know, one does one, the other does another, and each, each uh, action further sinks the person into the issue of despair or abandonment or alienation. So the treatment, um, fight types need to learn to notice and renounce their habit of instantly morphing abandonment feelings into rage and disgust. They need to learn how to tolerate being alone. As they become more conscious of their abandonment feelings, they can feel their abandonment fear and shame without turning it into rage or disgust and without letting grandiose overcompensation turn it into excessive demands made upon the other person. Unlike the other Fs, fight types assess themselves as perfect and project the inner critic's perfectionistic process onto other people. They don't own their behavior. They project it onto other people. So if they're feeling out of control, they set up a situation where they can make you out of control, <laughs> and then they can say, see, especially in narcissistic abusive relationships. So this guarantees them an endless supply of justification to rage. Fight types need to see how their condescending moral high ground position alienates others and perpetuates their present time abandonment. It's actually a form of traumatic reenactment, I think. Learning to take self-initiated timeouts at the first sign of triggering is a must. As soon as someone's aware they're being triggered, you want to take a deep breath and remove yourself from the situation. Timeouts can be used to redirect the lion's share of their hurt feelings into grieving. That's why grief is the key. Grieving all these things is always the key. And working through their original abandonment rather than displacing it destructively on those closest to them who are usually the ones that are not out to hurt them at all. But all that that they carry gets projected on someone else, and that other person is cast as a perpetrator against them. And it's very easy with victims of trauma. And anybody working in the trauma field, anybody in therapy, anybody in our groups needs to know this because it's much easier to find somebody to scapegoat or someone to get upset about. And when you're in ministry or you're trying to help somebody heal, you can't take any of that personally, ever. You have to understand that in this environment, you might be the safe person that they can go after, and so your response, um, your response can't be to shut them down or try to discipline them or other the other things that happen in the mental health system or the criminal system. You know, when someone's out of control, the way they come in and handle it, or police come in the home, and you know, it can make everything escalate. Not to say that police coming in the home isn't necessary sometime. I just mean that, you know, when someone's hurting over something, if a police was to come in calmly, but police don't know who's got trauma and who's about to kill them. But when people's limbic system is on fire and they're acting irrationally, you know, they can come in with all the hard line of the law. So... Um, Without real consideration for the other, without reciprocity, the real intimacy they crave will remain unavailable to them. And that's what's sad about it. They never get what they need and most desire. So I, always, I used to say, fake it till you make it. Now I say, faith it till you make it. <laughs> so now we're going to talk about the flight response. Flight types appear as if they're starter butter starter button is stuck on the on position. They are obsessively and compulsively driven by the unconscious belief that perfection will make them safe and lovable. As children, flight types respond to their family trauma somewhere along the hyperactive continuum that stretches between the extremes of the driven straight-A student and the ADHD dropout run running amok. So there's a continuum of response of perfectionistic one and the one that's going to do drop out brilliantly. And some people might start out as the perfect, perfect student and then they get sick and weary of it and then they become a complete, 
usually when they leave home and they go to college and they just become a complete, um, what do you call it? What's your word for it? <laughs> Bum. Failure to launch, yeah. So flight types flee the inner pain of their abandonment and lack of attachment with constant busyness. I think, um, I think Kimmy described that really well. It wasn't until the nest was empty that she had time to think about anything, consumed with activity. When the obsessive-compulsive flight type is not doing, she is worrying and planning about doing. Flight types are prone to becoming addicted to their own adrenaline, and many recklessly pursue risky and dangerous activities to keep their adrenaline high going. These types are also susceptible to stimulating substance addictions, as they are to their favorite process addictions. That would be workaholism and busyolism. Severely traumatized flight types may develop into severe anxiety and panic disorders. So the treatment, many flight types are so busy trying to stay one step ahead of their pain that the therapy hour is the only time that they have to make take themselves seriously. While psychoeducation is important, flight types benefit a lot from this psychoeducation. Learning to stop over-identification with the perfectionistic demands of their inner critic is the key. You know what I mean by an inner critic? It's the part that's always criticizing and telling they're stupid, they're not pretty enough, they're lazy, whatever it is. Learning to um, gently and repetitively confronting denial and minimizing about the costs of perfectionism is essential, especially with workaholics who often admit their addiction to work but secretly hold on to it as a badge of pride and superiority. Deeper work with the flight types gradually opens them to grieving their original abandonment and all of its losses. Grief work also helps these folks. As recovery progresses, flight types can acquire a gearbox that will allow them to engage life at a variety of speeds, including neutral. Flight types also benefit from using mini meditations to help them stop their habitual running. These folks do really, really good in prayer groups. They have dip daily devotions, things like that, a routine set aside that's specifically for your time for you. <laughs> we teach such clients to sit comfortably, to relax, to breathe deeply, and to ask themselves questions such as, what is my most important priority right now? Or what hurt am I running from right now? Or can I open my heart to the idea and image of soothing myself in my pain or allowing God to soothe my pain. Experiment with others in the group. We like to do this in the um, groups where people are invited to ask a question that they would never ask to just slow everything down and focus. Because when your mind's forever busy and worrying about everybody else and taking care of everybody else, they don't know how to do that. It's, very, it's a huge, painful exercise, actually, because as they tune in, they say they don't know what they feel. Um, and hypnosis can really work good. Finally, there are a number of flight types who exhibit symptoms that can be misdiagnosed as bipolar. That's the up and the down, all the busyness, the crashing because you're exhausted. It's not bipolar, but it can look like that. Freeze type and the dissociative defense over time creates patterns that can become chronic. Many freeze types believe that people are danger. People are dangerous and um, that safety lies in solitude. Outside of fantasy, many give up on the possibility of love. The freeze response, also known as the camouflage response, animals do it when they feel threatened. They just kind of melt in with the, with the grass <laughs> or the woods, and no one can see them. Um, often triggers the individual into hiding isolation from human contact as much as possible. This type can be so frozen in a retreat mode, like the starter button is stuck in the off position. And it's usually the most profoundly abandoned child, the lost child, who's forced to choose and habituate into their freeze response. It's the most primitive of all the F responses, the freeze. Unable to successfully fight, 
flight or fawn, the freeze type's defenses are a classical dissociation, which allows him to disconnect from experiences, experiencing abandonment pain, and protects him from risky social interactions, any of which might trigger feelings of being re-abandoned. Freeze types often present as ADD, and they seek refuge and comfort in prolonged bouts of sleep, daydreaming, wishing, and right brain dominant activities like TV, computer, and video games. They master the art of changing the internal channel whenever inner experience becomes uncomfortable. And when they're especially traumatized or triggered, they may exhibit a schizoid-like detachment from ordinary reality. So the treatment for freeze, there are three reasons why freeze types are the most difficult F defense to treat. Number one is that they project the perfectionistic demands onto other people. They spook easily, and they tend to self-medicate. First, their positive relational experiences are few, if any, and so they are extremely reluctant to enter therapy. Those who manage to overcome this reluctance often spook easily and quickly terminate. And they're harder to psychoeducate about the trauma um, as the basis of their complaints because, like many fight types, they're unconscious of their fear and their torturous inner critic. They don't even realize that they're doing that to themselves. The, the freeze types tend to project their demands on others rather than self, and they use the imperfections of others as justification for their isolation. Everybody is retarded. <laughs> Everybody out there is a moron. Everybody out there is crazy. Perfectionism and endangerment must be conscious and deconstructed. And the treatment for freeze types, even more than workaholic flight types, freeze types are in denial about the consequences. Because the freeze response is on a continuum that ends with the collapse response, the extreme scene in prey animals about to be killed, many appear to be able to self-medicate by releasing the internal opioids that the animal brain is programmed to release when danger is so great that death seems imminent. The opioid production of the collapse or freeze response can only take the individual so far, but then they have to use um, substances, drugs, alcohol. Many self-medicating types are often drawn to marijuana and narcotics, while others may gravitate toward antidepressants and anti-anxiety medica medications and s frequently over overdose them, overuse them. Moreover, when they remain untreated and unattached, they can devolve into increasing depression and, worst case scenario, into dissociative mental illness. And something that I want to say is on our, um, of our applications, we always put what your medications that you're on, and some people are as needed, like anti-anxiety, as needed, Valium, as needed. And um, you have to feel to be able to heal. And when people are completely over-medicated, and every time they go to the doctor, all the doctor knows is to write a prescription for the next complaint. And at the end of the day, they could be on 20 different medica medications that don't always have good interactions that are often prescribed by different doctors or the same doctor. And um, on our retreats, like to enter a grieving process, you can't be so numbed and shut down. And a lot of the medicine makes it so that you're dissociated. <laughs> It makes it so that you don't really feel anything. So people might go through the retreat, but I don't think they're going to have the full benefit when they're on gobs of medication. And sometimes what we'll do is we can never tell anybody not to take medication that's prescribed to them by their doctor, but we could say as needed, like try to hang in there today and not be popping you know, your Xanax every two hours. Because you're, you're just not going to be able to do the work to heal. So here's another little clip. Um, it's about the freeze.
just added that because I thought it was funny. Like, a guy was up there in some state of trauma, and the guy came and he just needed to be seen. He needed to be seen by somebody, witnessed by somebody. It's a simple little thing, but that act can be so healing to jar someone. I understand what you're going through, or I don't understand, but I really care about the pain you're suffering right now. So now we do the fawn. All right, you fawners, you ready? That's the codependent defense. <laughs> fawn types seek safety by merging with the wishes, needs, and demands of others. They act as if they're in they unconsciously believe that the price of admission to any relationship is to give up all of their needs, rights, preferences, and their boundaries. They often begin life as precocious children who learn safety and attachment can be gained by becoming the helpful and compliant servant of their parents. They are usually the children of at least one narcissistic parent who uses guilt or contempt to press them into service or shaming them from a healthy sense of self which fosters self-protection, self-care, and self-compassion. Fawners respond well to being psychoeducated and the therapist should help them recognize the repetition compulsion that draws them into narcissistic types who exploit them. It's almost like a healthy relationship they wouldn't know what to do with. They're only comfortable in a relationship where they're being exploited. Therapy should also help them reduce their listening defense as they are guided to expand their self-expression. 